how to become a grandmaster. I'm sure you're all wondering, uh, and a lot of players who are not grandmasters would love to be grandmasters. And that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I became a grandmaster and what it takes to be a grandmaster, both technically and as a player. Uh, First of all, uh, the GM title is sort of, a, it's very, when people say, what is a GM? And you say, oh, fuck, that's a bad, bad question, <laughs> because it's, it's very technical. Uh, so here is uh, the short definition. To become a GM, you have to have an ELO rating, uh, international rating of uh, above 2,500, or you should have been above 2,500 at some point in, in your career. And you have to make three uh, three grandmaster norms um, and and um, after i became an im i thought okay that was about it and then suddenly i made a gm norm a grandmaster norm i said wait a minute i can become a grandmaster and uh, after that uh, i had uh, well two years in hell where i couldn't think of much else than i wanted to be a grandmaster and eventually it happened in a uh, in January in Jutenborg in Sweden. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you the game. It was a dramatic uh, and a rather good game, actually, um, which made me a GM. Before that, I had gone for two years trying to find out what I needed to learn uh, to become a GM. Uh, and I, I noticed two things, and I was getting there with both of them. One, how do you become a GM? Well, you beat IAMs. That's, uh, <laughs> well, of course, it's nice to beat a lot of grandmasters, but it's not so easy. And, uh, and basically, you have to beat all the IMs. If you just beat all the IMs, you will become a grandmaster. If, and that's a big if, if you don't lose to the grandmasters. And uh, in my early careers, I had had big troubles uh, following the grandmasters. They just were outplaying me, especially technically and in positional positions. Uh, so I was always trying to confuse it, making very tactically. And I thought I was a great tactical player, which I probably wasn't. I'm still, I'm still not. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a better strategical player, probably more of a sneaky player, as you would say. Anyway, uh, so I was playing very aggressively. Uh, and then I, 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 some, at some point I decided, okay, they're just pulling me apart. So I started to play more solidly against Grandmasters. And eventually I started to make a lot of draws, not losing to the Grandmasters. And that was uh, about uh, there, well, beating the IMs, a lot of the IMs most of the times, and, uh, and drawing the Grandmasters. And that paved the way for my final uh, GM norm. Um, I was trying to a little bit uh, copy uh, Kasparov. He was, uh, the, his style resonated with me in a great way. But, but I later discovered that uh, it was maybe luck I became a grandmaster with this style because it's not my natural style. I'm probably more Kapovinian or what do you say? Anyway, we're going to see the game against uh, Beng Swenson. I was leading the tournament in uh, Jordanborg and uh, and I and if I won this game, uh, I would become uh, uh, very very close uh, to to the GM uh, title. I would only need I think a uh, half point in the last two games. So uh, this was an important game and he was the kind of guy, player I thought I should definitely beat. Okay, it was the second last round. So okay, uh, I'm white, I'm playing e4, and he always uh, plays the uh, knight of, um, which is, is this, and I always played bishop e2. I had very good results with that uh, at that time. Uh, later on, uh, black became much better at, at playing these positions, and they all all started to play uh, e5 here, which is, is maybe the best move. He played e6, which is much more elegant, the Schrevingen, uh, variation, but it's also more dangerous, and Black has to be very careful. Um, and uh, all this was, um, by the way, um, I'm going to show you a little thing. There is a, a general rule here that is, if if Black goes Knight c6, you always go Bishop b3. And um, oops, I should show you. And when he goes Queen c7, you go King h1. Uh, these sort of uh, moves, I, I can't remember why, but I'm pretty sure that rule still stands. That that's a good rule of thumb. 
So uh, if you're wondering with white. So here, bishop here. Um, bishop b7, moving forward. Queen c7, and here I go king h1. So I was already at that time following the rule. And I play a4. Uh, another line is, of course, to go uh, queen a e1 and queen d3 without a4. I like the a4 line. I had uh, this was in 1998. I had been uh, following all the Kasparov Karpov games and all Kasparov's games in this uh, structure, and I was very interested in this. Um, since my, after this game and, and later on, my results started to deteriorate a little bit, and I eventually uh, sort of lost a little bit of faith in, in white position, but I still think it's a very interesting position. Um, it's very, very sort of classical Sicilian style chess. Okay, bishop f3. Um, black is, 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 is of course uh, hoping for counterplay either with this, this, or maybe with, with this, and also um, rook e8 was one of the big discoveries um, getting ready to, to play bishop here and maybe this move and put the bishop on this square, um, making the king position safer. Also, this x-ray effect here is important and it's, sometimes it's also important that the bishop is covered by the rook. Um, bishop f3 is eyeing this uh, rook down here, making b5 or b6 impossible due to e5. So he has to, to move the rook. This is also a very natural move. And queen d2 is, is sort of waiting a little bit to see what's going on. Uh, I think nowadays they don't play this move, but it's, it's definitely playable. Um, a lot of different setup has been tried. Uh, they played a lot of games also in this in uh, the Anand uh, Kasparov match. Bishop d7, and as a, here's another rule of thumb for having in positions. Whenever black goes uh, bishop d7, white will go knight b3. Uh, the idea would be behind bishop d7 is to take here and play bishop c6, uh, but the bishop is not very well placed here. So white moves the knight, prevent the exchange, um, and, and black will probably have to relocate the bishop uh, to some square. And the best square is here, so he's losing uh, at least a tempo for that. Okay, b6, all normal. Um, sometimes black can even consider this move, actually, and, and get a double pawn, but get some counterplay and, and some attacking chance in, in the b and c5. d4, uh, maybe knight a5 is, is not so bad, but bishop c8 looks uh, natural, um, uh, getting clearing the, the square, so black will be able to do this. White is, uh, of course, pushing the pawns on the king side, but at the moment his king is safe. It might not end up safe later if black starts to have some serious counterplay. Bishop back here, bishop here, all very natural moves. Um, I'm sure black liked that it's pointing this way. So where do white want to attack here? Well, of course, over here. This is where... Uh, where there could be some problems. Problem is, you would love to use the f pawn, but that gives away this square. And with a knight here, black is pretty safe in general. So, rook, and getting ready to swing the rook here. I love rook swings in all parts of the game. It's, uh, it's one of the most elegant things in chess. Um, so we we'll probably see a lot of that in, in uh, the GM Talks videos. Bishop f8, all uh, normal, queen f2 preventing the knight from uh, going somehow eyeing this and white is also getting ready to do this uh, and putting the queen up here um, g6 bishop d7 queen f4 knight f8 um, and here um, i'd seen that this was possible and, um, and this is very interesting move uh, he, black looks like he's, he's, he's very good, and if he had the chance, he would, he would play something uh, where it get, like 97 and getting ready to, to, to meet with. But this move is, is, is a bit of a problem for him, because if he, for instance, goes like this, then his bishop would be buried down here forever. And this is maybe not so bad, actually. It could be possible. You're not getting mated, and, uh, and the g7 square is, is under control. 
Instead, Black decided, ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that, and then I'm gonna, gonna play the, take that, and I'm not gonna play the knight, and I'm gonna be fine. Uh, I'll have um, with f6, I will cover uh, this with with this square. Uh, also, maybe something like e takes a knight e7, a knight coming to f5 could be interesting. So he played here, but I had seen a very interesting attacking idea, uh, which I decided to try. So, uh, and this was a very crucial game for my career, so uh, we are not, you cannot accuse me of being a coward, because I played f6 here. What's the point with f6? Uh, it's very clear. Queen h6, bishop d7, mate. Okay. So. Yes. That's dangerous. Um, he played h5. This is also a very uh, natural defensive move, and uh, and he's hoping if I if I take here, he'll play knight e5, preventing anything, and the the sort of the king side is sealed. Uh, and also notice that something like this is definitely not very recommended, and uh, and and black is just fine. The, the king side is totally safe, and uh, and I will be worse. So, um, and he might even move the bishop. It's not certain that he will get made it instead. Anyway, the idea behind the move was this move, and that sounds crazy, but uh, the idea is very simple: take and mating on a take. And I've seen this idea work in other games, so I thought it was uh, worth a try, and it seems to, to work. He found this move, which is maybe not the best, and, and decided that that here, if, if, he just, if he takes here, I will just take the pawn, and my king can stand on g1, and, and he will eventually get mated. The problem is there is no, um, let's see, something like here. Um, He can defend um, all these, but he can't defend all the squares. So, so, so this this square is is now impossible to defend. So you can defend these two, but not this one. Eventually, he decided to sacrifice a pawn, hoping that he would get some compensation. Uh, he, but it's not enough. Just takes and. And I was getting very nervous here. I was uh, at that time I was a smoker, and I was uh, I was to be honest I was smoking a lot here. I was going out every move just smoking and saying, "Oh, I can become a grandmaster. I've been waiting for this for two years. I've been dreaming about this. I've been not studying on the university for two years to to get to this situation. Come on, sooner win this game." Um, and it did happen. Um, I did find a way to. Uh, and, uh, and the thing is here, uh, this bishop is luckily enough covering everything, uh, and my queen is, is controlling here, so I just have to stabilize everything and I will, uh, I will win. And of course the king has to stand on this square to, to make this uh, bishop even better. So, and, um, and this of course is, is winning now, I just have to be a little bit careful. And I don't have problems with that. King h1, going back, going in here, uh, getting ready to take that knight. And if he has to go, then and he will not have enough compensation. So he's trying to, to keep the momentum, tagging the rook. And again, I'm careful, just covering everything. And knight here, maneuvering in. And of course now it's winning. I just need to to get rid of this pawn, and uh, and I'll be be totally winning or exchange the last pieces. And black is of course trying to. And here I saw okay, there's nothing. What's okay? Take a pawn. Um, and well, it it is um, it is winning here. And he could resign. Uh, of course, you don't resign, um, but he could have resigned. 
and I was still very nervous, calculating every move very carefully. And here he finally resigned. Um, the knight is trapped, and uh, the queen is coming here, hitting this one with meat. And there's nothing he can do about that. So there's no checks, there's no break-ins of any kind. Uh, so black resigned, and uh, I had to make a draw with white, I think, in the last game, and I managed that against uh, um, Einar Gausel and uh, became a grandmaster uh, at the age of 26, which is rather late. Anyway, that's how I became a grandmaster. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, this was a, a sort of emotional game for me when it was played. Uh, and and I, I know that probably a lot of other young players are dreaming to become grandmasters. I can just, just say one thing, that it, um, it's not the meaning of life to become a grandmaster, even though it is nice. Thank you for watching.